One of the things that happened over the decades with the Manuscripts Commission was people's understanding of what the past was, what it was for, how you can use it, and how you should interrogate it changed. MacNeil was very much looking at how do you bring together all of these, these manuscripts? How do you make them accessible to scholars? And how do you introduce them to the interested public at the same time? It's a vast amount of material, archival material and historical material for people to actually suddenly be able to get access to. So the job of the Manuscripts Commission is to publish these sources for history, the raw sources, the actual stuff that people in the past overheard or did or said and never intended to put a spin on, never intended to have a purpose for the future. So we have all sorts of material from all sorts of people, but I think the most compelling thing about the primary sources we publish is that they record the names of thousands and thousands of people who would not be remembered otherwise, whose names aren't known to history. And it records things about them that wouldn't otherwise be known to us in the present. And this is a kind of unintentional consequence of our lives, um, that we generate material that in the future will become historically interesting. And this was particularly of concern to the Manuscripts Commission in the early years, because what they wanted to do was make sure that a disaster like 1922 would never happen again. The burning in the public record office in 1922 burnt a hole in the collective memory of Ireland. And for years after 1922, the new Free State began to debate the whole question of Irish history. Now, part of that was to do with the fact that, you know, this was a new state and everybody at the beginning of the 20th century believed each nation state should, should have its own history. And, of course, the Irish Free State was dominated by people who come from the nationalist background and were concerned with making sure that Ireland had a proper history of its own. But there were two other reasons why the Manuscript Commission was founded, as well as trying to make good the damage that had been done in 1922. One was there'd been a feeling really since the middle of the 19th century onwards that Irish history hadn't been written properly um, and that it was not done on a professional basis, not done based on the records themselves. And the third reason why the Manuscripts Commission came into existence was there was a feeling that people couldn't get access to the materials for Irish history. That, you know, even after the public record office burnt down, you know, a lot of manuscripts were in places that were relatively inaccessible. So the Manuscripts Commission was about trying to make that Irish history available to everybody on the island. From the creation of the IMC, um, Owen McNeil's own interests as a, as a historian were very much to the fore. And McNeil as a historian was not somebody who was simply interested in academic history. He was absolutely passionate about bringing history to the interested public as well. And this can be seen in a lot of the works that he did. So he, he wrote popular history. He was involved in a lot of uh, radio broadcasting. And these interests also play out in his work in the Irish Manuscripts uh, Commission. Now, one of the things that MacNeil realised is that many of the earliest sources were not accessible either to scholars or to the general public. So MacNeil, as somebody who was a historian of the early medieval past, he would work with manuscripts that would date from anywhere from, say, the 9th century up to the 15th and the 16th century. These manuscripts were found in many different places. So, for example, there are really important repositories in Ireland, particularly in the Royal Irish Academy and Trinity College, um, with the Franciscan Library down in Merchant's Quay. On the other hand, other manuscripts, really important ones to the history of Ireland, were found outside of Ireland. So there are really important collections on the continent, particularly in Switzerland, Germany, the Low Countries, and there's huge collections in, in Britain largely because of the colonial relationship between the two islands. So MacNeil was very much looking at how do you um, bring together all of these, these manuscripts? How do you make them accessible to scholars? And how do you introduce them to the interested public at the same time? MacNeil was advised that the best technology available at the time was um, 
something that's referred to as collotype reproduction. Um, now, the collotype reproduction process was invented in the 19th century in France. It was never commercially very sustainable. It was a, a very high-end production process. Um, it produced excellent quality in the images, but it was highly expensive to do. So in the end, there was only a small number of manuscripts that were actually produced in this way, but the standard of reproduction was incredibly high. And you'd have to say that MacNeil was very much far ahead of his time in thinking about the use of technology in order to make sources available to people. I mean, that's one of the things I think is remarkable, remarkable about him as a scholar is the extent to which public history was so important to him. And this even played out when we look at materials that we might often think of as very specialised or very academic. For MacNeil, there was no material that was too specialised for you know, the interested public to have access to. And this is very much reflected in the types of collotype editions that were produced. The project that started in 2017, which was hugely exciting to us, was um, the support we received from the Irish Manuscripts Commission, which allowed us to do um, an in-depth survey of 378 parcels, which had been gathered up and saved after the destruction of the Public Record Office in 1922 team that went in to salvage the documents were the staff themselves. And we can only imagine what that must have been like. But you do get that sense of urgency that they wanted to get in pretty quickly to see what they could find, to see what was left. And they didn't really pick up any old stuff. They picked up, I think, what they felt was salvageable, was something that someday somebody would be able to restore, somebody would be able to get back into a condition whereby they could be used again, they could be archival working documents as they were. In 2017, we were in the really fortunate position to collaborate with the IMC. Um, they very generously gave us funding to allow us to do an in-depth survey of the parcels. And so phase one allowed us to do that and gather up really essential information in terms of our knowledge. And so what the conservators did was they opened the parcels, they photographed, they documented. And then moving forward to phase two, which we're really excited about, is going to be looking at a more in-depth conservation of over 50%, nearly 60% of the collection. For the material that perhaps is too badly damaged for us to conserve, we're going to go back to those initial photographs from the survey and working with the listing archivist, we will be creating a catalogue which will be published, which will be fully accessible to people. And if unfortunately things are burnt, crispy and really fragmented and there's nothing that we can do, we'll have a photograph to show that. Um, but I think that transparency is actually really important as well. Um, and with those very damaged ones, we're also in collaboration with another very exciting project, which is Beyond 2022, which is a uh, project based out of Trinity College Dublin. And through that and the partnerships with other archival partners, such as the National Archives in the UK and the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland, um, we're looking at perhaps using some extraordinary methods of conservation in terms of scientific analysis to look at those really badly damaged documents and perhaps try and use things like um, X XRF or infrared um, photography to try and enhance some of the text that we can't read with the naked eye. But I think the key really for this work is actually, it's the list, it's really understanding what was there um, and that's the exciting thing as well. It's a vast amount of material, archival material and historical material for people to actually suddenly be able to get access to. What the commissioners were concerned with in the early days was all over Ireland in people's houses, in attics, um, in churches, in municipal buildings, in, in uh, courthouses, and uh, later on, even in business records, there were the records of what real people did in the past. And the job of the commission was to provide those records to the public so that they could develop their verdict on the past. So one of the things that we've been doing in, in the past decade or so is to present out of print editions online in PDF format or in a viewable format. And this is very important because one of the original aims of the Manuscripts Commission was to make this material widely available to the public because in the end, what the founders of the Manuscripts Commission 
saw and believed and the Commission still believes is that the history of Ireland belongs to the people of Ireland and that some people on behalf of the people at large should concern themselves with those materials and give them back to their owners. Thank you.